Now let's be honest, some of us can't relate to what we just heard. We think, yeah, right, come on. This is a different time, we can't do what they did. And if we could, it certainly wouldn't look like that. We can't gather in large groups and we don't know when we'll be able to. We can't have meals together nor take the Lord's Supper. And when we do, it's usually like this through a video screen. Now, how many times have you heard these words over the last seven months? Uh, uh, we can't hear you, you're on mute. So relating to these passages right now is difficult. And then we hear this verse 45 that says, we get all hung up. People sold their possessions and distributed them to folks in need. Anybody here contemplating selling their possessions and distributing the proceeds? Didn't think so. If you are, feel free to contact me after the sermon. This isn't the church of today, we say. Moreover, these early Christians were filled with awe and wonder, which we can't identify with. We haven't noticed signs and wonders. Maybe we didn't even see them before the pandemic. Some of you wonder if they're even possible. What has replaced our regular rhythms of life over these last seven months is isolation and despair. People continue to die alone. Some of you are gripped by fear, afraid for your vulnerable loved ones or yourself. Other of you are furious with the state of our politics and are disturbed to think about what's gonna happen after November 3rd. 2020 has had a bounty of brokenness, division, sickness, and death. So if Acts 2 seems like a pipe dream, better designed for a first century world than our 21st century context, I would understand. But today I'd like for you to consider that it's not a pipe dream, that it could be a possibility for you, for me, for Hyde Park United Methodist. With the scripture as our guide, my prayer is that we can recapture the awe and wonder of God or maybe even experience it for the first time. We can do it, even with the current limitation, even amidst the cultural and political landscape. And yes, even while we are experiencing our socially distant church reality. And if we don't, we could become what John Wesley, the founder of our movement feared. He said this, I am not afraid that the people called Methodists should ever cease to exist either in Europe or America, but I am afraid lest they should only exist as a dead sect, having the form of religion without the power. This undoubtedly will be the case, unless they hold fast to both doctrine and spirit with which they first set out. You see, Wesley was concerned that we Methodists would have a weak faith, doing all the religious activities, but not aligned or connected to the source. And if we are to powerfully live our faith, to grow in our love for God and others, as well as to participate in the transformation of the world, we must connect to God's power and we must live out the pattern. I want you to say that with me. Connect to God's power, live out the pattern. It's the way that God intended. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're all, this is great in theory, but I suspect some of you think, okay, how do you do that? So stay with me for a moment as we hit the rewind button in Acts and Luke, both of which were written by the same author. You ready? Here we go. The disciples, with the exception of the women, of course, were fresh off denying and abandoning Jesus. Everything they thought would be wasn't. Their hopes for a new kingdom, their own power and influence in it, and a politically powerful Messiah dashed by the brutality of religious and political power on a cross. It seemed like evil had won. They were ashamed, broken, and fearful. And they didn't even believe the women's testimony about Jesus's resurrection, not until the end of Luke's gospel, when the risen Christ shows up and says, stay in the city and wait for the promised Holy Spirit. That's when they believe. So they do that and they wait. And in Acts, the Holy Spirit comes powerfully and that power transformed these once inept men into being courageous and bold. Peter, the man who denied Jesus three times just a little over a month ago, now delivers a fiery, spirit-filled sermon to a group of people who didn't believe. Now, the people hearing this proclamation saw powerlessness in Jesus' death, not power. They couldn't believe that a crucified Messiah could make much of a difference in their lives or the world. Remember, Rome was still in power. The culture around them remained hostile to Jesus' message. 
not a lot had changed in the political or cultural landscape. The hearers' belief at that time was the law and their good works would rescue them and restore their nation. You know, we look around too, and we don't see a lot of evidence of change. We see a pandemic that has its grip on the world. Our country is descending into chaos. Like those first hearers, we have skewed beliefs too, don't we? So many of us think that we just have to be a good person and it'll work out, or that if our political party retains or gets in power, everything will change. We're prone to trust more in the power of our own intellect and our own self-sufficiency than we are in the power of a crucified Jesus. And Peter's message to them and to us is this, plug in to the power source. He tells them and reminds us that Jesus was raised by God because the power of death couldn't contain him. What those people were seeing was the power of the Holy Spirit, which was also readily accessible to them. Verse 37 says that they were cut to the heart. And they asked Peter, what should we do? And Peter told them they got to do two things and two blessings would follow. He declares, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, some of us get hung up on that word repent. In Greek, it is metanoia, which means to change one's mind or to turn around. Peter is inviting us to repent, to turn around from the things we think will save us and towards, turn towards believing that it's only Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that does the saving. And by so doing, we experience the two blessings, forgiveness and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus, you are forgiven for all the ways you have separated yourself from God. And you receive power through the Holy Spirit being activated in your life. And what happens? The outward sign of this inward transformation is baptism. Just this year, we celebrated six adult and 18 infant baptisms, which are the formal entry into Christ's universal family of God, the church. Now, I'm not saying that repenting and trusting Jesus means we abdicate our other responsibilities, our passions, or don't engage in the activities that we think will change the world. In fact, it may get us more active in them. But followers of Jesus' faith in redemption comes from putting our full trust in Jesus Christ, not on outside sources or our own resources or power. Some of you have done that. You've already done that. Others of you are exploring what that might mean for your life. And no matter where you are, you are welcome in our community here at Hyde Park. If anyone is watching and ready to put their faith in Jesus Christ or explore what that might even mean and wrestle with it, I invite you to contact me or any one of the pastors. You can click on the prayer chat, ask somebody to pray with you, do a connection card, but we want to hear from you. Plugging into the power of the Holy Spirit is what changed those first disciples and it is what will transform us. Repent, believe, and be baptized. And that power is what we will need to live out the pattern. Otherwise, we become just a dead sect like John Wesley feared. The reading that Cindy read today gives us the blueprint. The people in Acts gather regularly. They are grateful and they are generous. Will you say that with me? We gather, we are grateful, and we are generous. Now, we won't do it exactly like those first Christians, but the principles are the same even in a pandemic. And it was this very pattern that not only initially drew me to Hyde Park United Methodist, but it also helped me discover a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. The first time I walked onto the church's campus was over 20 years ago. It's hard for me to believe. I was searching, struggling with belief in Jesus and the church. I don't remember all of Jim Harnish's sermon. Sorry, Jim. But it was in it. There was something in it that I do remember. Jim was holding these large chains and he dropped them on the sanctuary floor. It was the old sanctuary. The impact made such a loud noise that it echoed throughout the sanctuary and it felt like it echoed in my soul. He stressed that Jesus can free us from whatever the chains are that are currently binding us. That teaching stuck with me. Sometime later, I joined Disciple Bible Study, which is a 32-week journey through the Bible, and it catapulted me in my faith. I was taught so much about the Bible and Jesus and was actually invited to wrestle with my doubt. The amazing leaders and group members changed me forever. In Acts, we don't see private solo Christians. They gather to be taught, to have fellowship, to eat and pray. Together, we form this body of Christ, all called, all gifted, all 
sent to make God's love real. Now we are gathering differently right now, I know, but it's still essential. When we don't gather for worship in small group, we aren't complete, something's missing because being a follower of Jesus means that you're gonna be in community. And that's what we've been doing this year through the Bible Project. More than 500 people are regularly gathering in small groups and doing the daily readings, reading the whole Bible. Who would have thought 500 people would do that in person, then transition to Zoom to read the entire Bible? You have been living out verses 42 and 46 of our reading today, devoting yourself to teaching, to fellowship, and spending time together. Now, some of you have been coming to worship for a long time, but have never engaged in a smaller community. And perhaps now is the time. You can just contact John at the email listed on the screen. What is it that you are grateful for? I want you to take a moment and just name th three things out loud for which you are profoundly grateful. And if you're with people, tell them and share that with each other. And if you're by yourself, type them in the chat or put them in the comment section. Verses 46 and 47 say, they ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. Christians are people who are grateful. You know, I've always been taught that gratitude is most effectively expressed, not by words, but by action. You know, my first day at Hyde Park all those years ago, I was struck by a church community who cared for the poor. I looked around and saw people who were struggling with homelessness, but the beauty was they were eating, they were interacting, and they were being loved on, not being treated as outsiders, but insiders. I witnessed connection, generosity, and prayer. Little did I know that that ministry was started just a few years prior by one volunteer's call on their life to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for about 10 homeless men who were gathering across the street from the church. Now, decades later, it grew to over 200 people with tons of volunteers. And since the pandemic has started, a small, committed, faithful group of volunteers gather each Sunday, distribute food to our friends on the margins, and make sure that they get mail and aren't forgotten. The woman who started Open Arms Ministry and those who are serving now are displaying their gratitude through action. I wonder how God is inviting you to show your gratitude. What can you do today or this week to express your gratitude for Jesus the Christ? Lastly, we return to that troubling verse that says the disciples would sell their possessions and goods for all when any of them had any need. And that's the final way to live out the pattern is to be generous with our money. In some ways, this is the hardest part when I was exploring Christianity, I was struggling financially. I was moving and I had 49 bucks in the bank. And much to my chagrin, the girl that I was dating at the time told the pastor who told this small group of men. And one day after worship, a man handed me an envelope and said it was from the group and it was a gift. It had $700 in it. I resisted it because of my big fat ego and pride. And the man leaned into me and said, Justin, God is trying to bless you. You need to accept this. Someday you'll be able to do this for someone else. You see, brothers and sisters, when we are generous, it blesses not only the receiver, but the giver. Like I said in the beginning, I don't think it's a pipe dream for us to live out our faith in this way. And here's why it matters. Our last verse today says, and day by day, the Lord added to their number of those who are being saved. There are people in and around you that are searching for meaning and purpose. And as we engage our faith and connect to God's power through belief in Jesus Christ, and when we gather and are grateful and are generous, people will discover a life-transforming relationship with Jesus Christ in the church that will not only change the course of their lives and our church, but eternity. Can you see it? Can you see the possibility? Let us pray. God of light and of love, we give thanks for this time. We pray for anyone who's feeling drawn to the message of Jesus, that they might reach out. We give thanks for the scripture that shows us how to connect to the power and how to engage the pattern to live out our faith. Help us to gather, help us to be grateful and help us to be generous so that more people will come not only to know about you,
but to be in relationship with you. Help us to do it more faithfully. We ask all these things in the power of the risen Christ. Amen.